All you will assist from our heart. Welcome and thank you on behalf of our family for being here today to help us celebrate the life of our heart. May he and I grown up with God as a father who is a larger life, really almost an American privilege. I mean, even in the games, we're getting at his own best. I mean, his, his dad was an archaeologist, dating a history. Bob was on the way to the 
of South Carolina, and that was a, a hot thing in childhood. An example would be uh, he was 10 or 11 and he and his cousin, the John Grant, were just on vacation. Your dad put them on the edge of the river, out there with a the canoe, uh, 22 rifle, two fish rods, and camping gear, and five dollars. He said, See you in six weeks, guys. That's the greatest on vacation. We were on the beach. That's, that's amazing to me. But he then, as a little older, early teenager, he would jump trains, hitchhike, hire a day back out west, or work literally as a cowboy in Dustin Broncos in Colorado, Wyoming. Basically, he shattered his shoulder. But he came back out a couple years later, um, and maybe fit a little bit about his age, and worked as a park ranger for Grand Teton uh, National Park. All this freedom really led to probably a lack of discipline for a while. He was a good elder child, a rain leader, had five boys, uh, was not doing very well at school, and his parents were just threatening him to go to their school. They actually sent him to go to their school. He learned quickly there that if he behaved and got good grades, he'd go out of town on Friday and Saturday night and parent him. So he kind of turned things around, became an opera student, was accepted to Walker College, where he studied. History and biology. You know, the Summers family teaches at Rich Spring in that day. They were married right after graduation. But then Bob heard that calling for adventure kind of whispering in his ear again, and he enlisted in the Marine Corps. He was trained to be a Marine fighter pilot. He flew jets, landed on aircraft carriers, and he carried that love of flying with him the rest of his life. Uh, he and I were talking last night about some stories where Bob was the happiest in an open cockpit. Like a steering dock on an iron air show that went in the southeast. He and I were too little to fit in the seatbelt, so we'd be in the front seat of the cockpit, he in front of me, and we would bump ourselves in. And Bob picks up the first time, really worried how we would we take this, uh, doing loops and barrel rolls. And he kind of checked on us and was like, Dad, do it again, it's awesome, it's amazing. But he and I also learned a little bit about gravity when we were doing if you're doing a loop, you will hop into a car and stick to the track. The same with an airplane, if you just fly upside down, you can fly you can fall right out of the airplane. So Keith and I had a little, little uh, strategy where we went to metal handles in the front. I would reach my arms around him and interlock him. He would go upside down and stall into the seat harness and keep him from falling out of the airplane. And again, crazy. But then Keith and I were talking last night about it. We promised we were sworn to see if we would never kill a baby. Is we were flying our way kickery, and it's not one of his friends skiing behind a ski boat. The Bob drops down about 20 feet upside down, and the conversation was out of about 30 seconds. He came out here on the beer line. And at the time, two dollars was the most incredible thing ever, but it probably was more than a child in here. But we wouldn't trade those excuses for anything. And Bob continued to. in the Marine Corps, he and Lady moved to Charleston. She worked two or three jobs to put him through medical school. They had Keith and me, and then he moved to Hickory, uh, where he became really a fixture in the community. He was a small town family doctor that was truly loved by his patients and, and served as an inspiration to me, not just to go into medicine, but he taught me a couple of lessons about how to be a good doctor. One was he treated everybody the same. It didn't matter whether they, where they came from or who they were. He treated with respect and dignity. And the second thing he taught me was it's not enough just to care for your patients. You have to care about your patients. And he cared deeply about his patients and called to make sure that they got the care that they needed. So after a couple of years of the digital practice, I bought the land through the world's family. It's not the thing he's invested his medical practice. He also thought it as a wildlife reserve, I think with his experiences out west and on the Edister River, he wouldn't want to make a difference in conservation. So he built these lakes and ponds, he put up wood lake boxes, built goose islands, and introduced a uh, an herd of English down deer, uh, some geese and wild turkey. And for his efforts, he was awarded the Governor's Conservation Award. <coughs> Award the Governor and Wildlife Federation of the Stoves. And I really 
you know, all the day job, your tablets, and medics, and the new that you can take care of them when you could. It was not a practical way. You remove these black new buildings, and logs, put the ones in, and stitch them back together, piece by piece, the same here that we did when we took care of the patients. The mob was fascinated with our pioneer bats and the circles of movement that we talked about, how they survived. He really embodied several of those traits himself. He would career stage four, new pathways, gave a good for hard work, and build an American ingenuity and know how. And there were sources of resilience, similar to the pioneers, that allowed them to survive and thrive in this land. I'm sorry, the funny story about his next book is in the store already. Well, what most of you talk about Bob is he was an incredible hard worker. Not just in practice, but literally out here, he went from spot to spot as he worked to put some of these buildings and teams back together. Had several friends that put some of them back here who came to once to help out.
We started Heart Square back in 1973. Always been interested in wildlife. Built these ponds, put in wood duck boxes. Brought in a, a deer herd, brought in four Canadian geese, which now populated over 100. Set up different ponds that you could flood with Jawapo millet for the ducks and the geese, and uh, enjoyed doing and preserving wildlife. No one could ever have imagined what the future had in store for this man, his family, and this land just south of Hickory. But looking back, it seemed predestined, all set in motion by the suggestion of a neighbor. Hey, Doc, he says, you know, it would be great. There's an old log cabin falling down over here behind my house, and he said, it'd really look good on that upper pond you just built. And uh, we put it up by hand, and we used skid poles and ropes. Then it wasn't long before the same young fella told me about a log barn that was nearby and said it would look nice by this log cabin. That basically is how it all got started. Dr. Bob Hart, a well-known and much-loved hickory physician, had discovered an obsession to go with his medical practice. Those cabins, which he found traipsing through woodland and field, spotting them from the air, rescuing many an abandoned old structure from time, and weeds, and each one a welcome addition to what became known as Hart Square. The dates range from 1763 all the way up to 1880. Almost every building has come within 15 to 20 miles from here. They all have been local in the Catawba Valley area. After 40 plus years, he has amassed in one place the largest collection of historical log structures in the U.S. And as if the cabins alone weren't enough. Dr. Hart even gave them life. In the business of flea marketing, you go in right at the crack of day. Morning, Ryan, you're late setting up this morning. Were you always sleeping? And people who are looking early are going to find the, the best buys for the money. What about the covering? And uh, you go in with blue jeans and, and tennis shoes is the best way to go. Hey, hey, what's up? My shoulder hurt, man. I don't, I'm not doctoring today. I'm antiquing. When your checks don't need to have Dr. Bob Hart on it. It's like a, like a hidden treasure. You're looking for hidden treasure everywhere you go. And, and you know, you find them. Spittoon out of a train station. They're going to ask $10 for it. You offer them eight. You never, never give them 10 all right, that'll go with the pot. How much you want for the pot? Dickering is part, probably part of the fun. 25, that, that's too high. 25. Bring me the middle of coat. All right, you know $30, $30. You're in the middle. I, th I think it's European, though. I mean, I've learned so much from so many friends that are dealers. Yeah, it's not a Piedmont. It's a Piedmont, I bet. And sometimes you, you're going to find your best buys in the field. So you, it's good to know a little bit about whether it's authentic and how old it is or how well it's been taken care of. Now that's a good buy right here. His good buys have included a hand-cranked butter churn and a dog-powered treadmill. Each lovingly placed treasure a fresh clue to our state's frontier origin. And certainly my wife Becky has a lot to do with the decorating. What we try and do is we try and furnish a cabin authentically, as much as possible, as if somebody lived here and walked out. You'll see that cabin sitting as it would have been seen in, in the 1800s. Each cabin has its own story. Each cabin is absolutely full of history. This dilapidated structure found 10 miles from Hart Square was used as a barn, but turned out to be an old schoolhouse from the 1840s. Now restored to its original purpose. It was a one room schoolhouse with two doors one for boys, one for girls. Underneath three layers of siding in downtown Hickory, there was a treasure hiding. Here we have the uh, Borgia cabin, which was uh, built in the early 1800s. Uh, Simon Barger, 
And upstairs, we demonstrate everything that you would have found in a weaving house. Before the Industrial Revolution, families made their own clothes or made clothes for others in upstairs rooms like this. One structure moved to Hart Square from a site in Burke County is still used for its original purpose. This 1760 mill was known by many names before Bob Hart christened it the Hicks and Bradshaw Mill after two of its owners. There once were over 30 mills in Catawba County, each located within a day's wagon drive from its customers. The miller would grind their grain on the barter system. This cabin, built by a carpenter in 1820, boasts a beautiful stone chimney. I was able to take it down in two days. It required over a year to put back. This chimney alone, along with the kitchen chimney, took almost two months. Kitchens back then were detached to reduce the risk of fire in the main house. Meals were typically prepared on an open hearth cooking at different temperatures and different times over a single fire, juggling several dishes at once. But the tasty home-cooked results usually were worth the time and effort. This log structure was an original barn, which we moved about five miles from here. And one of the first buildings that we put into Hart Square, we've converted it into St. Mark's Chapel. My grandchildren have been baptized in it, and it's been consecrated by the Bishop of North Carolina. Churches and chapels in the early days basically was void of a preacher, and the person who came was called a circuit rider, and he might visit you every four to five weeks. And in the, in the interval, then you would have somebody that was a deacon or senior member of the church would act as the preacher for that particular service. The circuit rider himself carried an organ, which folds up. It's called a wagon organ. It's been in the church here for over 30 years. It's never been tuned. The tone is perfect. thing that I, that I love mostly about moving these cabins is going back and finding people that, were, that lived in them, that were born in them. After a day spent searching for one owner, he finally found Essie Norwood, who once lived in this 1860 cabin. Problem was, she was in the hospital. And only a doctor could go there at 12 o'clock at night and knock on the door and ask her what she was going to do with it. Well, she gave me that cabin. She and nine children were raised in that one cabin. And she told me she could remember the front room as she came in. She could see through the cracks of the floor. She could see the chickens underneath the cabin. Well, I marked those four boards, and if you go in that cabin today, you will see cracks in the board. You can see all the way to the ground underneath. And I brought her back. You should have seen the tears that came out of her eyes because we used every board and every window that was in that particular cabin. You know, I give a lot of credit to my wife. She's put up with me now with this village for some 40 years. Now, I say I have a passion. My wife says I've got an obsession. But I promised my wife after about 60 that I wouldn't move another one. I say I'm through, but you know, if you find a little unusual one. You know how that goes. The spirit is willing, but the heart is weak. A history book inspired his next project. The story was about Adam the Pioneer Sherrill, who in 1747 became the first European to cross the west side of the Catawba River and settle there. To protect his homestead, he built a stockade. You know what happened next. I look at a log cabin, the first thing I, is, can it be restored? Well, I love finding something that is not gonna be here in five or 10 years that I can bring back to life. It's great to find a cabin that has not been restored electrically or new cement or moved. The log stuff between them just falls out. That old square nails, you can reuse them. I use a lot of modern day tubes, even though I find that in some cases, the old tubes are better. The iron sometimes sharpens better. 
I use log carriers to carry these logs at 100 years old. The chisels, I mean, a lot of the stuff we still use even today. I come out here six days a week probably. Uh, Sundays I go to 8 o'clock service. I'm out here by 9.30. So I can be here from daylight to dark, live every minute. Several months and countless man hours later, the 97th restored log structure in Hart Square adds a notch more texture and a whole lot of history to the village. Hart Square is a place filled with home places. Home places rich with memories made over time. I guess this house means a lot to me and my sister. We grew up in this house visiting our great uncles and great aunt. The house had stood empty for about 15 years. We knew that it would deteriorate. I had heard about Dr. Hart's village and we sort of sent word to Dr. Hart that we had a log cabin. Our uncle Wade, who lived in this house and had always told us there was a log house underneath. The part we're in right now is like a cocoon that was inside of the rest of the dwelling. We do know that the house is probably the oldest house in the village with the date of 1763 scratched into one of the bricks on the chimney outside. It's a special time for us because when we come in and, and click, get the house ready for the festival, it's just a time we can be together and reminisce and talk about all the good times that we had here in this house. We're just very happy that the house is here and it can be shared with so many people. This house, along with everything in it, goes on public display once a year when the village comes alive during the annual Heart Square Festival. We used to barbecue a pig on the grill just to have a few people come in and people making apple cider and stuff, but it's grown into a major event. The festival is always a full Saturday in October and tickets sell out in one day. Beneficiaries include the foundation Bob Hart has established to perpetuate the village and the Catawba County Historical Association. Good job on the weather, Bob. Hey, <laughs> dude. <laughs> really good job on good the job weather. Good job on the weather. We have 250 people that come in and demonstrate. We like everybody here to be dressed in costume. And I don't know of any place in the country they will come in and demonstrate on original equipment, tools. Chris mill break down, belt broke on it, and we've had somebody relace it. And we had the conjun break down. <laughs> I got it working. Got it, they, they got it working. Why do I think people come here? They see people as they would have seen them in the 1800s. Would well, that be awesome or what? Mm. I'll be back at five o'clock. Yeah, okay, good. <laughs> it brings memories of family, particularly grandparents, great-grandparents, and it's the way that they live. They can appreciate and remember doing things. They can remember slop jugs. They can remember going to an high house, you know, and not having running hot water. And I've enjoyed teaching, and it's the way that I can possibly preserve life that our generation can appreciate what their forefathers had done to make life as it is today. One of the ways that I relax mostly is when everybody's gone and I can walk through the village and look at the different buildings and have the feeling of warmth as if I had lived in this time. I've had a, a wonderful life working, doing what I love doing most and enjoying the history, researching it, putting these buildings back as if somebody lived in them. To me, that's not a way that God said, I love you. I told my wife, I want to be cremated. And I want my ashes spread over the village. And hopefully, upstairs they may have some log cabins.
so. And then, as little as a week and a half before this, Miss Becky and four of us went out to dinner at the Western Spirit Steakhouse. And while there, as usual, he had a number of ex-patients. Even one that came over and said, you delivered me three or 35 years ago. Of course, Dr. Bob remembered me. Yeah, anyway, it, it was that kind of a situation, and I, I, just, I just couldn't make myself believe that this really was that Dr. Bob had really left us. After realism set in, I said, this is really happening. I went into anger. Uh, this man knew and knows more about our heritage, our 19th and 18th century ancestors than anyone alive on the planet. And I hadn't asked him nearly enough questions. So he had no right leaving us this Sunday. I said, well, that, that can't be. But after rethinking the situation a little bit, I thought that Dr. Bob accomplished more in an 83 year lifetime than most could hope to accomplish if given two or three lifetimes. With just that much difference. And I'm saying, who am I to deny him a chance to go high on the mountain and get his rest? And we all know that if he had stayed here, he would never have rested. He had so many other projects he wanted to do. So uh, we, we just, I just had to say, okay, Dr. Bob deserves to go on that mountain and get his rest. And, and I'm proud of him. His legacy and, and uh, what he accomplished here with Park Square is a national treasure. Uh, if Ham Wright, the legacy of our ancestors, who were able to come here in a hostile environment into a wilderness and create a lifestyle that was just absolutely beautiful, if you spend time quietly in Park Square Village, you can understand that they have a great lifestyle. That legacy, along with the example of Dr. Bob's life, is such a great teaching point for this location. Dr. Bob uh, felt that without, without titles, depending on someone else's effort, you can never achieve true happiness. And what a lesson that is that we need today with our youth. Dr. Bob was a person of great faith. He believed that through grace we have a chance for eternal life. He was a forever friend I look forward to seeing him in the future. Call me up and say, Hey, Dave, meet me over at the village at five o'clock. 
or stop someone who does something they don't know is okay. But we had the tools and supplies to repair any issues that may come up with over 100 plus log cabins, DVs, they come up. Bob would always take time to answer questions. You know what I ask? I learned to stop the car after I started driving early on. So, because I, I knew that's a lot. And I'll say, me and Bob and I worked as big as a team, especially doing the best. Son, Gary. That's me to get Bob to play more golf. Remember that? The reason was, Eric said, these fish that fish six and a half days a week. And it just needs some warmth. So guess what? For years, we traveled two or three states with UNC Chapel Hill meeting to the scale, playing tournaments all over, non tournaments. Dr. Bob Pierce was one of our players. Lynn Wong was one of our players. We had a great group of people. Anyway, we joined, so Bob later joined Grandfather Country Club. We played all the tournaments up there, three and four day tournaments, as well as some other events. It really killed Eric when we beat him a couple times. It really did. And his young guy was always said, this is the, this is the deal with it. I hope when I become a big fan of your kid's age, we can out have as much fun as you do. Bob and Beck do this in my life at Trinity Ridge. Once a week, religiously. Oh, oh, she was being here for me. She was there for three years. Sure. 
about the food and the eggs and the people that he reached their grandpa on one of the slabs. Grandpa told him about the sit by and get back at home with him. Just like when you're judging a living, you just can't find work. One thing that we don't know about Bob is he loved telling the stories. If you need to buy me, you need to turn out, you need to wear it. I'd love to hear some of those stories you can tell you. You know, I always tell the doctor's stories that come out to me. You know, there was a couple of times that we'd be out here at the corner, right in the main room, and the doctor would kind of get to a kind of certain mode. A lot of times we'd be out on the golf course, boat, close to the lake. He'd just get the lot there, he'd put bread and sit. I can't believe the law that we've been able to do out here. It's like a few people for us. I think at times that that's when you realize the whole spirit of taking beer that he was sick. But he also told me that it would not have been possible without everybody's help, contributions, time, effort, everything else. Especially this thing. His passion and obsession, the works that all of you contributed to, is something that he wanted to be preserved and shared with future generations. That was his passion, his obsession. Our passion and our goal and our vision is to help keep God's legacy alive.
in peace. Let us pray to the Lord. to all the Lord a short confidence in my fatherly care, that casting all their grief on me, they may know the consolation of my Father. Give courage and faith to those who are grieved, that they may have strength to meet the days ahead in the comfort of a reasonable and holy hope, and the joyful expectation of eternal life with those they love. Grant us grace to entrust God to thy never failing love. Receive him into the arms of thy mercy and remember him according to the favor which thou bearest unto thy people. Amen. Grant that uh, increasing in knowledge and love of thee, you may go from strength to strength in a life of perfect service. Grant us, with all who have died, the hope of the resurrection, to have our consummation and bliss in thy eternal and everlasting glory, and with God in all thy sins, to receive the crown of life which thou dost promise to all who share in the victory of thy Son Jesus Christ, who liveth and reigneth with thee in the Holy Spirit, and with God forever and ever. The very first cabin to the last. How poor is my mind and heart into this very special place. Today, therefore, we lay God's remains to rest by casting them from an aircraft flying during the ceremony to fall upon and rest in the village we love so very much.
precious and eternal life through our Lord Jesus Christ. We commend to Almighty God our Heavenly Father. And we commit his body to the ground, earth to earth, ashes to ashes, blessed us. The Lord bless him and keep him. The Lord make his face to shine upon him and be gracious unto him. The Lord lift up his countenance upon him and give him peace. Rest eternal grant to him, O Lord. May the soul and the souls of all who have departed through the mercy of God rest in peace. I can show we do not have much time to glad the hearts of those who travel this way with us. So be swift to them, and may peace be kind. And may the God of peace, who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus Christ, the great shepherd and strict sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make us perfect in every good work to do his will, working in you that which is well pleasing in his sight. Through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory and honor. After the final hymn, the family will be dispersed into different areas within this building or out of the grounds so that you can greet them and continue to maintain our, our wish to keep everyone safe. Also, there will be a, in the children's area, a classroom, there's a uh, slideshow that I think is going to be put on so people would like to go look at that while they're waiting for the family. So, go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.